Life Audio. Hey, welcome to the third and last podcast in our unique, special Valentine's Day series. Thank you so much for the feedback. We, we hope this is groundbreaking and moving the dialogue uh, back to the whole notion of love and romance and, and how that relates to God and how our brains are created, how we've messed it up, uh, how we've been embracing really old ancient Roman and Greek concepts uh, of, uh, of what love is. And I think that makes us boring people. So anyway, uh, this is the third and last and what's love got to do with it? Again, here's, here's Tina Turner. What's love got to do with it? What's love but a second-hand emotion? What's love got to do with it? Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? I mean, you can hear uh, the pain, right? She was a woman who was tragically abused from her husband, Ike, and you can hear the depression and shame that comes from that. No judgment, that's human, and she's not alone. Nothing has hurt all of us more than relationships gone bad than uh, corrupted love, love post-fall. Women have been so often the brunt of humanity's dysfunctional, selfish, unmutual, unequal love. But all of us have suffered post-fall. So that's the question, right? What's love got to do with it? It's, it's important because it's how we were created. This is one of the greatest gifts of God for, God for us to experience love and to love each other. And we just don't do it very, very well, even though the two great commandments are love God and love others and, and love ourselves, right? So a third, all of us consciously or subconsciously long for that kind of love where we feel adored as we are, where it's safe, trusting, intimate, caring, mutual, where someone wants my experience of being loved to be a priority. Attachment theorists say our brains are asking those two questions. The first one is, is there anyone there for me? I mean, right? Does anybody have my back? Can I trust anybody really? And the last one, the second one is, am I lovable? Is there anybody out there who will love me? You know, when they know the, the dark secrets, my mistakes, those kind of things, right? And at some murky, shadowy place in our scarred brain, we still expect that kind of love. It's wired into our brain, and we hope for it in relationships. And you know what? Relationships on this side of heaven rarely rise to that standard. And so I'm guessing for many that that expectation is on the decline. We become suspicious. We become skeptical, right? Maybe depressed. God made our brain to need such a love. And, you know, we can suck up all the love on planet Earth and it can't begin to fill that broken, fractured cup. It is made ultimately to receive God's love for us. And that's what I want to talk about in this podcast. But God also put in our brain sophisticated protection mechanisms to guard us from being hurt. And, and see, you can see the cycle, right? Because that creates barriers to the intimacy we want. So it's that cycle. I jones for being loved, but then when I give it a shot, I get hurt or it's not satisfying. It falls short of expectation. My brain puts up another wall or finds a substitute for love like self-medicating. And I so I jones for more, wash, rinse, repeat. Yeah, welcome to the modern world. And then it gets worse. In that cycle, my brain develops a critical inner voice that blames me for the problem. You know, the, the thing is, you're just not that lovable or beautiful or smart enough or funny enough or thin enough or fat enough or tall enough or athletic enough, Christian enough, pure enough. And that's why people treat you so badly. That's why you're so easily overlooked. If you were more impressive, you know, you'd be treated differently. Or if you were this sex or this race or this country of origin, yeah, you'd be treated differently. In her book, Yes, Please, comedian Amy Poehler describes this inner enemy as a demon voice. She writes, this very patient and determined demon shows up in your bedroom one day and just refuses to leave. You're six or 12 or 15, you look in the mirror and you hear a voice so awful and mean that it takes your breath away. It tells you that you're fat and ugly and you don't deserve love. And the scary part is the demon is your own voice. Wow, yuck. So who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? Here's the problem. There are lots of different kind of love around the world. It's this generic category. The world is a buffet of different kinds of love. But the way we're created, 
there's only one that reaches the high bar that our brain is made for, that the puzzle piece actually fits, only one. And so in this podcast, we want to get dig into that. We want to illuminate what that real love that we're really looking for here and not finding. What is it all about, particularly in Valentine's season? In the end, I think uh, you'll be encouraged and hopefully begin to feel that love a little or a lot. But before we dig into it, let's take another word from our sponsor. See you in a moment. Have you ever found yourself in a moment with your loved ones where you were there, but you weren't all there? Let's be honest. We've all given our leftovers to our biggest fans instead of our best. For Dr. Josh and Christy Straub, marriage and leadership coaches and host of the Famous at Home podcast. With a realistic, grace-filled look at the struggles families face, we cover topics designed to help you become a rock star under your roof, set healthy rhythms between work and home, and build a rock-solid marriage. Because the greatest red carpet you'll ever walk is through your front door. Hey, welcome back. Well, in the two podcasts already, can you begin to hear the Roman philosophy in there somewhere on on what love is? Remember, for the ancient Romans and Greeks before them, love is a function of the object. If you were better or more enough or whatever enough means, people would treat you better. They would tend to love you. You would feel more loved, Uh, right? But back then, men were more worthy than women. So they said, uh, two choices. If you're not feeling it, you clean yourself up, you, you improve your lot, you get educated, you, you dress up, you whatever it might be, or two, you give up. <laughs> Maybe a third, you self-medicate. So you pay for sex, for partners, for porn, for, uh, right? Blame yourself. It's tragic, but that's kind of what we do. And this is the love that Tina was singing about. We're desperately in need of a real love, but we've all experienced something that's less than that. Dangerous, confusing, it tears down. Oh my gosh. So I wonder which love you subconsciously mean when you say God is love. Do you, do we project our fractured, selfish, broken, fragmented love on what his love is all about? I mean, that would be normal, right? I remember asking one lady, not a Christian, she had suffered years of abuse from multiple male partners. And I asked her, well, what did she think of God? And would she be interested in hearing more about God? And she said something to this effect, that if there was a God up there, if there was, who supposedly loved her and yet stood by while she was getting beat up over and over and over, she didn't want to spend eternity with him. He was an abuser. She couldn't imagine being exposed to just another authority figure uh, who would just use her, who would abuse her, uh, not love her. And I get it. You may agree. But God's love is better. It's way different from ours. It's uh, our, His love, and when we experience it, is so much astonishingly better. Gregory Boyle says, when the vastness of God meets with the restriction of our humanity, words can't hold it. Yeah, that's, I think, anyway, that's what I want to talk about, that kind of love. And I mentioned C.S. Lewis's categories, agape, eros, phileo, storge, he was a brilliant author, one of my favorites, uh, but he, he wasn't a biblical scholar. He imagined agape, and others, well-meaningly, after him, have as well. But when they talk about it and describe it and hand it to us, it feels more like a contract, something unemotional, something rational, something distant and stuff held back, um, non-touching. Kind of the love that, remember Star Trek famed Mr. Spock? You know, that's kind of how we imagine agape. I got to tell you, it's kind of boring. And uh, so let me give you an example of what agape would might entail. So you're employed by a kind person, your boss. They sign a contract with you. They have to treat you well. They have to pay you appropriately, compliment you when appropriate, not be rude in a broad sense. They quote, unquote, love you. But that's the thing. You may never see that person. You may never see them smile. You never uh, be hugged by them. You may never hear their voice saying, well done, good and faithful employee. You may never experience what they think of you positively. You just may not. It's a distant kind of relationship. Not bad, but really? But that's not God's agape. His agape is very experiential. I think we've lost that. It's, it is rational, there's no doubt. It's reasonable, but it's emotional too. 
We're whole people. We can't separate the, the, the mind and the heart or frontal cortex from the midbrain. We, we are whole people, and God's love loves us wholly. And it's powerful. You have to notice it. You can't just be, oh, yeah, yesterday I loved it. It changes you, and that can be scary, and I think God's love is scary. It should be. And remember Paul in Ephesians 3, you just begin to experience, right, not just know about, not a bullet point on a PowerPoint presentation. You begin to experience the measureless, inexplicable love of Jesus, and it's experiential, not just legal and contractual. When God's power comes upon you, this is the same power that created the universe that raised Jesus from the dead. It comes into your inner being through the Holy Spirit. And when that happens, one of the Greek words for power is dunamis, where we get dynamite, right? You're shaken. It affects your pulse rate. It affects your uh, sweat breaks out on your forehead. You know what I mean. You actually feel it. And this is true whether you've been abused or abandoned. You've never known the love of parents. You've been, Whether you have learned to not expect that because for whatever reason in your culture, you're physically unattractive or, or you've been bullied, or you've been mistreated, you've been shredded emotionally. Or maybe you, you have brain development issues and, and you can't experience that, that thing normally with human relationships. You can experience it with God. You could be a hardened addict, and yet this power is big enough, vast enough to make you feel loved. Yeah? I mean, not perfectly. That's heaven. You'd explode if, you, if we experience it all the time here. We're not ready for it. But it's noticeable. You know you've experienced it once if you're a Christian. You know. That's our expectation, Stel. So is that what we think about the love of God? Because that love is dangerous. The Romans at least got that word right. They believed that love was dangerous. We think it's dangerous too, but for different reasons. This is so different from the love of Buddhism, which is which is this distant God, almost impersonalized love. God's love, our God's love is real. It's visceral. It's it's mental, but it's also emotional. It doesn't leave the objects the same. It may not make the object more beautiful. I mean, think back to the Romans, or more attractive or more righteous or more pure or more worthy. Its thing is to make the object, as as he or she is, feel loved, and it pursues that object. Well, let me tell you a story. My first book, co-authored by Colleen Pepper, The Kiss of God, is all about this love. It's portrayed in the Old Testament book, The Song of Songs, and one of the reasons we wrote the book, and by the way, I'm updating the book uh, even now, uh, hopefully to get it out sometime later this year or, or early 2024. It's about this love. And one of the problems is interpreters, and we talk. I talk about this in the first couple of chapters of the new book, is we've been embarrassed by this. It just, we, we're just ashamed of this pursuing God who pursues people and pursues the unlovable. <laughs> and yet, that's God. Um, and by the way, I'm going to start on a podcast probably at the end of February, beginning of March, to look at the Song of Songs, kind of verse by verse, the love of God. So don't miss that gospel rant Check it out anywhere you get podcasts. Pass it on to people who are feeling unloved, lonely, feeling depressed, feeling uh, suffering with suicide ideation, self-image issues, all of those things. There is a love of God that actually loves and makes people like that feel that. I'll say more about that. Anyway, the Song of Songs in the Old Testament is about this stunning, vast, <laughs> uncomfortable love for, here we go, unworthy objects, unlovable objects, people. We were... We were under contract, by the way, Colleen and I, by a major publishing house. I won't tell you who it is. And after working with us for 12 months, they canceled the project. Apologetically, the head publisher, a biblical theologian, was concerned that this this embarrassing notion of romantically pursuing God would just be offensive to a lot of their Christian audience. (laughs) And uh, I won't tell you what I told him. It was unfortunate. But you know what? After thinking about it, I think he's right. Uh, I think it is offensive. I think we're frightened by it. I think we're, we've are we been taught to be ashamed of that kind of love. But yet, that's the innate love of God. Our brains both long for that love subconsciously, but we're afraid of it at the same time. Because, like Tina says, <laughs> you know, what what's love but a second? And we've been beat up by it too much. Nothing has hurt us more than, than love. And... This love of God is not the love that the ancient Romans imagined from the last podcast or feared. 
I mean, I think they should have. Can you imagine what might have happened if Roman slaves who made up as much as three quarters of the population, if they started feeling this transforming love of God and began to feel that they were people of value? Imagine how that would have changed the entire society, the entire culture. Or what if the women began to feel that? I mean, a bulk of the women or the young boys who were being used functionally as love slaves. What if they began feeling like they were worth more than they were being treated? Um, and, and some did, by the way. I mean, that's the history of the, of the first and second century church. But what if even more did, or even today? All right, let me try to clarify how I understand God's love. Imagine a spectrum, zero to ten. You know if you've been listening, I love spectrums. Zero is human's love, our love. And it's the entire trinity, eros, agape, phileo. Eros is, uh, we understand it to be sexual or intimate love, agape. Uh, we, we call it the love of God. I'm going to push back on that. And then phileo, companionship. On the other side of the spectrum, 10 is God's love. Again, the trin- trinitarian, the trinity of love, agape, eros, yes, and phileo. Uh, so on one side is our love, fallen, post-fall, and God's love on the other side. What's the difference? Okay. Um, well, on the human side, agape, there is human agape, by the way. Read the Bible. Uh, C.S. got this wrong. Eros and phileo. Uh, they're all self-focused, selfish to one degree or another. No judgment. Me too. Uh This love, to one degree or another, uses others to satisfy longings so that I can feel dopamine hits, right? Remember from the first podcast, it, to some degree, uses others. It, to some degree, objectifies others, uh, makes them into objects for my use. That's the idea. Uh, So that love, to one degree or another, is a function of the object, the beauty of the object, how much the object turns me on right? Or satisfies my longing, makes me feel good about myself, gives me that hit of dopamine. And so whether it's attractive, makes me feel good, responsive, beneficial to me, my reputation, you you get the idea it's self-focused. So on that side, self-focused love, agape, eros, and phileo. And so when eros is self-focused, the better Greek word, uh, the one the Bible uses is porneia. Remember the, in the, uh, in the Bible, eros is only used twice in the Old Testament. Porneia is the word that Paul speaks of when he's speaking of self-focused eros, or, or even self-focused agape. It, it, so it would be that kind of using sex. It would be pornography. It would be the, the kind of thing that one enters into to bleed off powerful urges, to give me a shot of dopamine that makes me feel good. Not really caring if the other feels or is loved or is honored or saved or gets that same shot. It really is to some degree uncaring of the other, dishonoring, selfish a little or a lot. That's eros at zero. Are you with me? And and there's human, human agape that's selfish, zero on the scale or one or two. I love to get things. I love to get things that make me feel good. I love to, to get pats on the back that make me feel good. You get the idea. I love... That because the object of that love is beautiful or attractive. I get hits. I love the lovable. I don't love my enemies. I struggle with that. Some neighbors, have you met my neighbors? I don't particularly love people who hurt me, who don't want my best. All right. That human agape, to some degree, is normal human love, but it's on the selfish side. You following? On the other end of the scale, this is what I want to point out, is God's selfless love, 10. And by the way, he's never a 9 or a 9.5 or a 9.9. His is 10. His is selfless. He does not need dopamine hits. He doesn't need his reputation built up. He doesn't need to feel safe. His love innately loves others, loves enemies. That's all there, that's all there were. He loves sinners. That's the nature of his agape, his phileo, and his eros, his intimacy. It's other-focused. He wants his bride to experience that love. He wants his love. That's his goal. That's what 10 looks like on the spectrum. By the way, that's the Song of Songs. We get a picture of that. It's emotional. It's visceral. It's romantic. It's intimate. Um, It's unembarrassing. This is God's love. It's what we're longing for. And I would say we're a little afraid of it. Now, put it in, in perspective, and again, I'm just guessing, but our best day. On our best day, our best love might be a 2.5. I think I'm being generous compared to God's 10. 
And so those loved by us, even on good days, tend to remain empty and dissatisfied and still longing for more. And there's another reality. We've been so beat up by disappointing, unsatisfying love on good days um, that my broken brain, my vulnerability gets surrounded by razor wire and impenetrable. And so the other reality is when God's love finds me, I need healing. I got open wounds. I'm unwilling to reciprocate or, reciprocate or receive. So what do I need? I need power that comes from God, God's source, that can make me become more vulnerable, more open, more trusting. By the way, that's faith that makes me be loved. And he's got that. That's part of his package. In fact, he sent his spirit into our inner being, Ephesians 3. You've heard me talk about it a great deal. Whose secret motivation is to make us feel his favor, says John Calvin. Make us feel his love for us as we are right now. And that power alone can overwhelm, beat up our critical inner voice. It can love us through all of the scars. And so on that side of the scale, God's agape, eros, and phileo is actually transforming and healing to broken people like me, like you. His love on that side of the spectrum is not a function on whether you're good enough or worthy enough or lovable enough, beautiful enough, pure enough, righteous enough. You may have suffered severe abuse by cruel, selfish people. You might feel ashamed. I mean, think Tina Turner. You might feel dirty, unlovable. God's love loves such people. That's what he loves. That's all of us to some degree or another. No less and no more than anyone else. It's equitable. It's mutual. You may have been that person who has hurt others, right? And chances are God's love expands to encompass you, to embrace you, to forgive you, to hold you, uh, to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You're my beloved son or daughter with whom I'm well pleased. And being so other directed, his love takes the penalty for all of your crimes and pays for them, all of your crimes and sins and impurities. It's an amazing, vast, unique love. There's nothing like it anywhere else, and it's exactly what I need. I quoted Gregory Boyle before, but he could have said this, when the vastness of God's love meets with the restriction of our humanity's ability to be loved and to love, words can't hold it. Yeah. So when we say God's love, we're not speaking about Anything else that we've experienced from any other human here, it's ridiculously higher than that. It is, like the Romans feared, dangerous, but not for the same reason. They feared human eros in particular. That's the word they particularly used because it was destructive. It led to destabilization of families, to wars, to to broken cultures. God's love is dangerous because it heals It rewires social norms. It restructures the society uh, where the the beaten up become honored and and the ugly become loved. The outies become uh, people of worth and experience it. It changes the culture. You can't keep people down. Uh, It restructures. So, you know, God's love is uncomfortable. Jesus, here's a great example. Jesus tells a hillside of outies. I just did... Uh, a podcast. I'm finishing it up, uh, uh, but uh, on the Sermon on the Mount, and I did a workbook. Jesus said, "What? Check it out. It's uh, on Right Now Media. You can get the workbook at Amazon." You know, Jesus tells that hillside of, of Audis, right? The Sermon on the Mount. So many religiously impure. They had zero expectations of being favored by God. I mean, they they didn't believe they were favored by God or lovable. There's no way they thought God would favor them. They're the poor in spirit. They got it. They, Jesus says God embraces people like you. And so he showers them. The very first things out of his mouth is blessed of the poor in spirit because the kingdom of heaven is yours. Let me unpack that. It includes the love of God is now yours. I'm surprised he wasn't killed on the spot by the religious leaders. He offered God's love, the same love God gave to Abraham, to Moses, right? He offers it to the unworthy, the sinners, the unrighteous. They got it. And Matthew tells us that great crowds of the beat up rejects followed Jesus. I mean, think about it. It would have been pretty revolutionary, transformative change within their guts, within their brains that made these suspicious, 
doubting, beat up people follow the guy who says God loves you. It, it almost sounds too good to believe, right? And they would have been skeptical. They would have had to to survive. Uh, here's another story. We had a convicted child molester well, uh, become a Christian, start coming to our church. He was in jail, got out of jail, started coming to our church. Oh, my. There's a challenge for you. And everybody in our congregation praised God for the uh, the man's salvation. But, you know, in what world would this guy be as loved and honored as us, as our children? <laughs> right? It, it raised some questions. And when he started coming to church, there were legitimate safety issues, to be sure. We worked very hard on that to address it. But it was a head trip. It, it became a dangerous place because the, this kind of love that we were talking about now places him, a child molester, convicted in the same arms as a person who wasn't a child abuser. This love placed him in the same arms as my child. God's, right? Head trip. Dangerous love. But that's what we talk about. So thinking back again to the ancient Romans, it's, it's true for us today. When we say love, I mean, functionally, we still believe it's a function of the object. It's the air we breathe. It's how we were raised. It's how we're treated. And yet God's love is a function of the subject. It's a function of God. And the price paid for that love, it was costly. It was paid 2,000 years ago for Christians. And so God, humanly speaking, and this is from the point of the a uh, view of hum- humans, we unworthy, unlovable humans, the way we think of it, God has to love me because of what Jesus did. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that theologically. It's, it's from my point of view. The point is he absolutely does without hesitancy. All right. So no, I know I dropped a bomb earlier, didn't, didn't unpack it. We have largely been told that God's love is agape. That is God's selfless love. But we have been also told that he doesn't have anything to do with Eros. <laughs> that, that's just really troubling, right? Wait a second. I learned in children's Sunday school that God's love is agape. That's it. Well, I'm going to suggest biblically that's just not accurate. God loves Eros, at least, you know, the good stuff. God created intimacy. Don't you, don't you believe that we were designed for it? God's love includes selfless eros. Think that spectrum again. Not porneia, that's that selfish eros where I care about my hits. It's selfless eros where I actually care about how the other person experiences relationship and intimacy. It's honoring. It's it's uh, mutual, right? Uh, porneia is how eros got twisted up post-fall. And, and I want to dig into that. But this is probably a good place to take a break for a sponsor or a cold shower. I'll see you in a minute. Why are Christians always so serious? I'm Barnabas Piper of the Happy Rant Podcast, where we take Jesus seriously, but not too much else. Subscribe at lifeaudio.com. Okay, back to my statement that God is not just limited to perfect agape love, but also perfect eros love. Here's here's a extensive blog quote discussing the late Pope John Paul II's provocative theology of the Bible. Just listen, quote, Eros, in and of itself, isn't meant to be avoided. Precisely the opposite. Eros is meant to find a home in the human heart by being united to agape. For most of us, the erotic is not something we intentionally yearn for more of, We usually associate it with sexual arousal, which can overtake and impel us to act in the heat of the moment, frequently without full consideration of the consequences. However, this is not true eros, but it's counterfeit. John Paul II calls it reductive desire. Yeah, that's I like that. So um, let me comment. John Paul observes that because of the fall, we are now caught up in a value blindness, which moves us to subconsciously reduce the other to their sexual value alone. We objectify them. So can they satisfy my longings a little or a lot? And that's the core of eros on the destructive side of the spectrum, consciously or subconsciously. Fallen men and women, without the transforming power of the spirit, will tend to use others to satisfy their own sexual appetites and desires. It's a selfish eros. Think of a broken marriage uh, where where the couples are saying, I just 
don't get satisfied anymore by this person. This person doesn't turn me on anymore. Sex isn't good for me anymore, right? I get it. <laughs> Believe me, I understand. I've heard that from, from many, many, many people. I'm not saying they're evil. I'm suggesting that they've come to focus on their own selfish eros. And that's not God's original plan for relationships. That can be seen in the Garden of Eden, I think, where our foreparents' desires were for the other. John Paul II, again, he defines godly eros, isn't that great, as a, quote, inner power that draws men toward all that is good, true, and beautiful. Here we go, quote, authentic eros was experienced as a profound receptivity to the other for his or her own sake, as a unique and unrepeatable person whom God called into being with their own journey and path to wholeness. While reductive eros considers how to discharge sexual tension, authentic eros creates a bond of belonging with the other through a reciprocal giving and receiving of the gift of self. Far from being opposed to agape, to self-sacrificial love, eros is integral to the full experience of human love because redeemed eros sees and embraces the whole value of the other from top to bottom, left to right, inside to outside, for whom we want to sacrifice. The entirety of the beloved is received and welcomed, even the prickly and shamed fill parts. Ah, Close quote. So agape then is not to be separated from eros. Otherwise it becomes rational and and distant and, frankly, boring. I mean, we might pull off some dopamine hits, remember, from the first podcast, but we're not going to get serotonin and oxytocin. We're not uh, going to feel bonded and belonging and loved. So how can we access this redeemed godly eros? Um, We can re-experience our intimate bonding of belonging to Christ by faith. Uh, And here's Pope Benedict. God's eros for man is also totally agape. God is at the same time a lover with all the passion of a true love. Eros is thus supremely ennobled, yet at the same time it is so purified as to become one with agape. See how we've missed this? The fruit, uh, back to uh, Benedict, the fruit of this meeting of divine eros and agape within the human heart is a union in which both God and man remain themselves and yet become fully one the two, and yet one, an intimate bond of belonging, union and communion. The fullness of human desire and happiness is fulfilled only through purified eros united with agape. This is true in our relationship with God, and it is meant to be mirrored in our relationship with others. Oh my goodness, that's beautiful stuff. I mean, I think it would make a difference in society. I think this is groundbreaking. We need to dialogue and think about this. Eros didn't just occur after the fall. I think that's the implication in a lot of our modern teaching. There was a holy and godly Eros sourced from God in the garden in perfection with both Adam and Eve. It became twisted and reductive after the fall. But what we have come to understand as Eros and run from it and are afraid of it is, in fact, porneia. Porneia is, at its core, the use of someone for our own selfish reasons. It thrives in power and balanced Relationships where one can or does use or abuse the other for their own benefit, uh, sexual gratification, power trips, reputations. It's uncaring. It's objectifying. It's destructive. It is born of shame and shaming. It's often angry. It measures. It grades. It criticizes. It blames. It averts the eyes because eyes are telling. So now let me link all the podcasts together. And, and here I'm in the realm of wild speculation, but I think it's as good as, as all the other speculation regarding love. Here we go. Here's my assumption. Number one, we're created by God. And as such, our brains are made to long for a relationship with him. Pre-fall, it was clearly reflected by the relationship experience between Adam and Eve. They didn't have broken inner working models. They didn't have mommy or daddy issues. They didn't know sexism or sexual abuse or manipulation. Their love was other focused. Adam wanted Eve to feel loved and adored. Eve wanted Adam to feel loved. They didn't need lecture on gender roles. It wasn't necessary. They were both equally good. It was how God imagined it. But then the fall. Enter shame, nakedness, fear, um, you know, judgment, laughter, comparison, measuring. And love becomes selfish and self-focused. Hearts become needy. And we became suckers to be drawn into selfish, abusive love, sex, porn, addiction, 
uh, lack of mutuality and love, abuse, right? So we passed a broken, largely self-focused, self-satisfying love around ever since, at least in comparison to the selfless love of God. We look like, from heaven's perspective, like druggies on the street, jonesing for a hit of something that would release dopamine and make me feel less lonely in pain, a little or a lot. And then Jesus came, opened the resources of God's love again, not through legislation or law like the Romans. We tried that. It was through the mechanisms and hopes and desires of the spirit and our inner being, where we can access, through whom we can access power of God to begin to experience this height and width and length and depth of the love of God. That's agape and eros and phileo, companionship. Ephesians 3, as we are, not as we should be, our brains again to begin to do what they were designed to do. We start getting relational dopamine shots as designed. Remember podcast number one? Uh, and, and not so what I'm talking about on this bonding and intimacy, this eros of God, I'm not talking sexual, meaning related to physical kissing or hand holding or anything else, nerve endings rubbing, none of that. But I do think that within our midbrain, the creator of our midbrain flips a switch and he makes us feel dopamine for the sake of bonding, for the sake of feeling good and, and oxytocin, the bonding chemical making me feel that God is actually good with me and I'm in his arms and he is saying, even though I can't hear it, you're my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. That he really likes me as I am. He wants to be with me. I have his attention and I can see in his eyes that he really does. Between humans, oxytocin happens during physical arousal, right? Body part, nerve endings. The God who created our brain isn't limited to that physical path. His spirit pulls those levers. I feel a powerful bonding with God, chemicals in my brain. And and I get it. My my prefrontal cortex says, that's God. He is telling you he loves you. Feel good. Relax. No sex involved or implied. It's it's good for men, women. By the way, singles and married. It's it's not limited to anybody's inability or ability to be physical or or some destruction in in the parts of the brain where they can't feel that anymore. Are you with me? Or in person who's sex responsive, and I'm thinking particularly of professional prostitutes and such, who who have become sort of emotionally deadened, um, nerve endings deadened to oxytocin and and dopamine. God can break through that. That's such great news. And look, I know I'm going to get criticized for this and being misunderstood. I get it. I accept that. I am not suggesting that God has sex with us. I'm suggesting that God used the spirit and the power of the spirit to make me feel Jesus' love, makes me feel as good and as welcome as partners would after intimacy, or even better. It's a brain thing, not a genitals thing. Such good news for singles and singles again, for people in the sex trade, for people who, who can't have sex anymore, for people who've endured physical damage. This is such good news. God's got this. And... This incomplete agape and eros and phileo, that's the perfect stuff, selfless stuff. That's what you're jonesing for. It's addictive. It's how you're created. It's a brain thing. So how do you access this more? Uh, As I'm closing up this series, here's a good Valentine's Day prayer for couples, uh, for individuals to access agape, eros, and phileo from God. You deserve that so much better than a pretty card. Here we go. Just pray this. God, I need your help today. I made a vow to to love my other perfectly in sickness and in health, whether they love me back or not, whether they treat me kindly or not, whether they respond to my love or not, whether they change in in a way that I don't appreciate. But honestly, this is a lot harder than I thought. Oh, I have good days when I wake up next to them and feel a deep love. And yet, then there are those days when I wake up wondering what I've gotten myself into. God, what's wrong with me? I'm just saying, is it true that you love them with all the love in the universe? Jesus paid for that. You love them as they are, not as they should be. Is that the gospel? Well, then I'm begging you, Holy Spirit, make me feel your love for them. Agape, eros, and phileo right now before I go and do something stupid or say something even worse. Make me feel your love for me as I am and also your love for my other as they are. Now, please. Oh, yeah. And the dopamine and oxytocin would be great. Thanks. Amen. So once again, I would encourage you to listen to Jaira, the worship song, long version. If I had the rights, I would be playing it for you right now. But I also like um, 
Lauren Daigles, you say, and here's a quote from that, you say I'm loved when I can't feel a thing. You say I'm strong when I think I am weak. You say I'm held when I'm falling up short. When I don't belong, you say I'm yours, and I believe. I believe what you say of me, I believe. So is this making some sense? I'm hoping you've been encouraged. Uh, we got a little bit in the weeds, but I hope not too much. You know, I, I hope you understand a little bit more about the love of God and how to access it. And by the way, make sure you follow me. I'm inviting you. I'm begging you to follow me through the Song of Songs. I'll be starting really soon. And uh, I hope in the very next Gospel Rant podcast, it's for people who long for this higher, dangerous, agape, eros, and phileo of God. I think you'll be shocked. This isn't the Song of Songs that you've heard of. Um, You can check out uh, Colleen Pepper and my book, The uh, Kiss of God, on Amazon. And by the way, I'm finishing up a new book for tweens called The Unlikely Prince. On his quest, the young prince finds such a love in a very surprising place. If you have a heart for young teens and tweens and you want to help me with this project, I mean, I'm looking for support and companion and uh, uh, people to come alongside of me to help promote it. I'm looking for champions. Let me know, bill at gospel-app.com. It's very important to get this out there. Uh, I need people who would read and promote this in your, in your context. It's a lot of fun, great characters. I mean, it's modeled after the Chronicles of Narnia. It's a thinly veiled gospel presentation without the churchy language. So come join my team, Bill, at gospel-app.com. Thanks to lifeaudio.com for their platform and assistance in this series and marketing. Next time, uh, like I said, we're going to be looking at, hopefully, the Song of Songs. Um, And look, do me a favor. Like this podcast on whatever platform you, you listen to it. Put it on your Facebook and Twitter. Promote it. Your friends will be so glad you did. You may even help some struggling marriages out there. Leave comments on your podcast platform or let me know directly what you're thinking. Bill at gospel-app.com. Always love suggestions. Take heart, child of God, and happy Valentine. Hey there, it's Nicole Yunus, host of the How to Study the Bible podcast, where every single week we join together to encounter God through His Word. You can subscribe at lifeaudio.com.